We live? All right. Well, listen, I'm glad that you tuned in tonight. Uh, I want you to take your Bibles, go to 2 Thessalonians as you're turning there. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Of course, uh, Brother Frank Morrison is, li uh, is uh, interpreting for, uh, for the deaf uh, using ASL. If you're interested in that, you can find him on Facebook at Frank, Mor uh, Frank Morrison is his name. And, uh, you know, I just want to remind you about Mother's Day on Sunday. We'll have Brother Dan Souza with us here at 11 o'clock. And uh, afterwards, my wife and I will be in front of the church passing out carnations. If, you, if you'd like one of those, we've done that now for years. Uh, and also, if you are not feeling well or you can't make it, we can bring one by uh, on Saturday. Uh, we won't, uh, you know, be intrusive, but we'll like to come by and just give that to you. Uh, be in prayer, please, for the Jarvis family. Uh, Sarah's dad went to be with the Lord this morning. And we'll be praying for them, for comfort for them. And be in prayer, please, for Forrest. Uh, Forrest Lane, his mom, uh, has a low-grade fever this morning, and they're just keeping an eye on her and going to be testing her again uh, for the virus. So lots of things happening. You should have gotten your prayer list today uh, through email. If you did not get that, please uh, let me know. I want to keep you up to date with what's going on. Uh, and my email address here is info at tristatebaptist.org. And I'd be glad to help you uh, in any way that we can. Also, if you go to our, uh, our website and you click on Pastor's blog, uh, I, I put some notes on there about when we plan to open, which doesn't look like it's going to be till the end of the month anyway, or close to the end of the month. But that's, you know, we're only looking at three or four more weeks of this, and then, Lord willing, we can get back together and be safe about it. So I hope, I hope that you're praying for this situation, praying for those who are uh, really feeling the effects of it. Uh, and... Um, we're just going to trust the Lord until this gets worked out. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, if you can turn there, please. We're going to start this, uh, this series uh, a number of years ago now. We, we touched on 2 Thessalonians. We've never really done a book study here, but we're going to tonight uh, and, and for the next few weeks to come. If you look at verse number 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, the Bible says, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus... Uh, unto the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is at meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God uh, in, I'm sorry, for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, uh, that ye be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this church family. And Lord, I pray that it won't be long before we can meet together uh, in this building or, or maybe around the fire pit in the back. Uh, but Lord, as a church family, I'm looking forward to seeing the faces and shaking the hands and uh, Lord, just be, being part of each other's lives again. And Lord, I, I pray for each that is suffering the effects of uh, this time away from each other. Lord, I know there are some that are struggling with being lonely. I know there are some who are struggling with the family members who are ill. I certainly pray for the Jarvises tonight. And uh, Lord, I, I ask that you'll help us to see uh, where Paul gets uh, just the courage to say, rest with us. And uh, Lord, may that be our hearts tonight. Uh, thank you for allowing us to meet together virtually. Lord, I know there's many that cannot even do that. And I'm grateful the Word of God is present and centered in our lives. And I pray this and ask it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you notice, please, I mentioned uh, in verse number 7, it says, and to you who are troubled, look what Paul says. He says, rest with us. Rest with us. Uh, if you don't have that marked in your Bible, if you're one that marks in your Bible, that's a great expression to mark. Rest with us. Notice what he says, to you who are troubled, rest with us. Paul, it's interesting that Paul is saying that he also is resting. Certainly his ministry is not a ministry that you would... Uh, say was restful in, in not only the labors he put into it, but also in the fact that uh, the, the tribulations that he went through as a, as a preacher. Uh, the word here, if you look at uh, this word rest, the word means to get relief or to relax. 
It's like when you're working hard and you stop to, to sit down and we say, I'm just going to take a rest for a minute. It's that time of rejuvenation. It's that time of relaxation. And it, notice that he's talking to believers who are troubled. And uh, uh, understand that Paul here is hundreds of miles away. He's probably in Corinth when he wrote this letter. And he's talking to people that are troubled and he's offering them rest. So the rest that he's offering isn't for him to come over to Thessalonica and deal with the people. He's not talking about a physical removal of what their problems are. What he's talking about here is a difference in their thinking. He's talking about a difference in their perspective on what it is that they're going through. He says, I want you to rest with us. Well, Paul, how can I do that when I'm in the midst of all of this mess? And he says, he says I want you to rest with us. And he's going to mention many things in this, in this book in terms of rest, but he, he is going to focus down to verse 7, or verse 8, he says, in, uh, verse 7, I'm sorry, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. Look what he says, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In verse 8, and we'll get there in weeks to come, he says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. So he's talking about certainly that second coming. Uh, you know, that word troubled in verse number 7 is, is a very compelling word. It's, it, it's sort of a colorful word. It means to sort of squeeze and push into a direction. Uh, they would use it to, uh, from what I'm told, now you know my farming abilities are somewhat lacking, but I'm told that when a cow goes in to get milked, they put them into a contraption that sort of squeezes that cow so it can't get her, go anywhere, and when it's done, it sort of squeezes it out. And, and that's the idea of this word, world tr this word troubled. It means to be pressed, but pressed into a direction. And, and of course, uh, thinking about what you say when you're under that pressure, but that's exactly what we're talking about here. Because usually, usually uh, pressure for us usually is not a physical thing. It's not, it's, not a, you know, it's not a physical squeezing. It's not a physical problem that you're dealing with. It's usually mental issues that are causing your mind to, to get distressed and get worried and to get over, overwhelmed with things and it sort of presses you into a way of thinking that may not be the best way of thinking. And Paul says, listen, I'm going I'm to invite you to come and rest with us. And what he's talking about here is relieving what is pressuring them by reminding them of some things that they may have forgotten. That's what we're talking about tonight. We're talking, we're talking about the, this idea of resting with Paul. We're talking tonight about rest in who you are. Rest in who you are. That, you know, when we look at this, if you remember in 1 Thessalonians, the, the church was undergoing great persecution. And apparently, the time frame between 1 and 2 Thessalonians is about two or three months. In between those times, somebody wrote a letter to the church at Thessalonica and said that they were in the midst of the tribulation period. That's why Paul's going to talk about it so much. Uh, but if you go to chapter 2, please, and look at uh, verse number 1. He says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our, our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. You see what he said there? Verse number 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. But he says in verse number two, that you soon be shaken in mind, nor be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter from us. So clearly you see people here are trying to change, uh, change the foundation that the Thessalonians are putting their faith in. Somebody's trying to dis disrupt that for them. And Paul here is, is writing this letter in order to relieve that pressure, if that makes sense to you. And he says, listen, I want to reassure you of some things. I want you to rest in some truths that, that maybe you don't quite understand, and it's causing you to have this anxiety and this pressure, and it's troubling you. So Paul's going to say, you know, and, and what's interesting is, if you notice uh, just for a moment, because he's, he, he's not going to present this as an easy road. Uh, Paul isn't going to come in and say everything's going to be great, and it's all going to be wonderful, and you're not going to suffer anymore. Paul's not going to say that. And what's interesting is the partners that Paul is traveling with, if you look in verse number one, he's with, he's with Silas and Timothy. Uh, uh, these men understand tribulation. Uh, I'm sure you know in the first missionary journey that Paul took that he was able to lead Timothy to Christ. 
Timothy was from Lystra. If you remember the book of Acts, Lystra was where Paul was stoned, what they thought was stoned to death. And I'm sure Timothy, if he didn't see that, I'm sure as being a small town, he certainly heard about that. And he knew that Paul had taken those knocks on the head and that he was supposedly dead and they dragged him out of the town. And of course, I believe the Lord raised up Paul again. And Timothy knew that the ministry wasn't going to be an easy ride or that the Christian life wasn't going to be without persecution. But, but, but they knew the challenges. But they also knew that there was no greater joy than being in the midst of what God was doing and being where the Lord wanted them to be. So they, they came into this. And this church, this church at Thessalonica isn't known for expensive buildings. It's not known for um, uh, prominence or size or any of those things. What this church at Thessalonica is known for is that it's known for having a heart for God. And that's a wonderful testimony for a church to have. Uh, you know, if we're going to take a church in the New Testament and point to it and say, that's the church we should model, this would be the one. Because their faith is spoken of. They, the, the way they love people, the way they love God, the way they receive the Word of God. Uh, this is the church that you want to be. Uh, it, it, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God, Bestow it on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. That is the church of Thessalonica, that, that the church at Corinth, Paul is talking to Corinth and saying, hey, you guys, you know, lifting them up as an example, you, you haven't seen anything until you've seen this church in Macedonia, these, Thessalon uh, these Thessalonians. So remember, if you look at chapter 1, please, for just a minute, 1 Thessalonians, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Look what he says in verse number 3. He says, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. So in other words, th this was a great church. You know, it wasn't great in size. It was great in their ability to work and in their reputation. And, uh, you know, it, it wasn't... Uh, when you look at what, what makes a, a great church a great church, I mean, you know, when you think about it, there's churches all over the place, uh, but what makes a great church a great church? And it's not just fellowship. Uh, certainly that's, that's a big part of, you know, your church life. Uh, but what makes a great church is people who recognize that what we have in our hands is the Word of God, and they receive it as the Word of God. In other words, it's not the preacher's opinion, it's the Word of God. And they not only receive it, but they act upon it. You know, when we, we, of course, just came past our 15th anniversary, we didn't get to say much about it because, you know, the situation that's happening here. And those 15 years, those 15 years ago on April 24, 2005, I remember like it was yesterday, that first morning uh, for Sunday school, and my wife and two daughters were there, and we were, we were just standing there, and it was 9.30 in the morning, and we just did not know what was going to happen. And a few folks came in. We had 17 come in for Sunday school. We had 40 people come in for the morning service. And we, you know, we had, uh, we had nothing. We had a sound system that I was controlling over here. We had an iPod that we used for music over here because I didn't have a piano player. Uh, we didn't even have an usher to take up an offering that day. Uh, we, had, we had chairs that were given to us. We had the old pulpit that's over here. We had that that was given to us. We had a sound system that was about 400 bucks total. Uh, and somebody had, had sent us money to buy a CD recorder so that we could keep track of the messages. And that's what we had. And that's the way we started. We didn't have anyone we knew. Uh, we had one person, of course, Joanne Dubois, who had called us and said she was coming. But other than that, we didn't know anybody who was coming. And then over the course of years, people started to come in the door. Many out of curiosity, out of, you know, that church who met by the big cannon down there, you know. And, uh, and, and, and they came in and they heard the Bible preached for what I believe is what it says. And they started to change and their lives started to change. And they started to see that there was value in preaching and value in a church home. And they started to join the church and we started to grow and we added chairs. And, and, and what I'm getting at here is that when, when people believe God, the lives get changed. And when lives get changed, that impacts other people. And people see those things. And, 
and, and they're more willing to hear a message about change when they've seen it evidenced in somebody's life. And that, you know, when, I had a man not too long ago who came to the church and he wanted to know the secret. Pastor, tell me the secret for your church. How come your church was successful? And, and, and he's looking at me like I'm going to be able to give him a bullet list of, you know, here's the 19 things you do to be successful. And I can't do any of that. I'm not that smart anyway. Uh, I tell him, listen, it's, it's just the Bible. It's just, it, it's just the Bible. You know, and, 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 and I understand what he was getting at, but, but the truth is that's all it is. It's, you know, you have to love people and you have to preach the truth. Love people and preach the truth. And, and that's what's going to help any church. And uh, wh when you look around and you see changes, it, you know, it's not because of the architecture of a building or any of those kinds of things. It's, it's really, uh, people will visit because you have a nice building. People will only stay if it impacts their life. If they feel like God's dealing with them, they'll stay. If, if they just like the padding on the chair, they're not going to stay. That's this church in Thessalonica, and I believe, of course, our church is that way. Uh, and, and that's where Paul is in this letter. They have a great reputation. They're on the right path but he's going to encourage them to rest, not to cease from activity, but to cease from uh, uh, being overwhelmed with the tribulation and the things that are surrounding them. So Paul, Paul says he wants them to rest, and, and tonight's message, as I mentioned to you, is called Resting in Who You Are. And there's a few just subtle things I want to bring to your mind here. Uh, we won't be long tonight, but I want to just remind you of some things that are true in your life and are true in our church life that Paul is going to remind the church at Thessalonica. I want you to see, first of all, their title. Their title. Uh, notice, please, in verse number one, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, look what he says, unto the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice Paul says, he, he says they're a church. That's very important to remember because understand this letter was written to a local body of believers, just like the Tri-State Baptist Church. And, and what's interesting is not every book of the Bible was written that way. Certainly uh, Ephesians was, uh, Colossians was, Philippians was, but many times like Galatians, it was written to a group of churches in the area. First Timothy, of course, was written to Timothy and Titus is written to Titus. But, but uh, First and Second Thessalonians is written to a local New Testament church, just like ours. And, and that word is, is very interesting because uh, this letter is written to this group of people that are gathered together. And if you notice this word church, and forgive me if I get a little basic tonight, this word church is used 116 times in the New Testament. Three of those times, uh, and the word means an assembly or a called out assembly, three of those times it's used in the book of Acts. Uh, hold your finger here, please. Go back to the book of Acts, chapter number 19. I'll show you how, because it's, talked about a, it's talking about a called out assembly that gathers for a purpose. Acts chapter 19. A called out assembly that is gathered for a purpose. If you look at verse 41. The Bible says, And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. That's our word ecclesia. That's our word translated church in our, our Bible in 1st Thessalonians, 2nd Thessalonians. In this case, in the book of Acts, they are a called out assembly and they had a purpose. It's not the same purpose we have, but they are a called out assembly gathering for a purpose in mind. So, so that's our word ecclesia. Those people had, had, had been called out of their homes for a purpose. In this case, it was to protest and they had all gathered there for that purpose. And three times in the book of Acts, it's used in this way. Those people came out of their homes. They came out for a purpose, called an ecclesia, not called a church. Notice it's called an assembly. Uh, but for the other 113 times, the word is translated church. Still gathering together, still gathering for a specific purpose, but the purpose isn't to protest. The purpose is to worship together and to carry out the great commission of the Lord together. That's our purpose. Our purpose is to glorify God. We are to meet together. We are to uh, enjoy the fellowship around, uh, around the preaching of the Word of God. But our goal is to carry out the Great Commission, right? Reach other people, teach them all things, see them baptized, 
and, and hopefully they join a local church. Uh, and, and I say this, that um, what, what is different about our called out assembly is that not only is it a group of baptized believers, but it's bound by doctrine and it's led by biblically qualified leaders. In other words, there's a pattern here. It's not, it's not the Ron Berard Club. It is the Tri-State Baptist Church. And the Tri-State Baptist Church adheres to the policies and, the, and the, the, the outline that the Word of God gives us. And that's very important to understand. Because, uh, and I stress that because so much of today is not modeled after New Testament polity that, that you find people doing all kinds of crazy things uh, under no biblical authority at all. And, and, and that's just not, not God's way. God's way is structured, accountable. We answer to each other. Uh, and, and listen, missionaries and ministers, all, all those people should be under a local church somewhere along the line. They should be under a local church's authority. Uh, there should be oversight because, listen, if there's no accountability, that's not God's intent. And I hope you understand that. So when you read the word church in the New Testament, please don't think of a building. Don't think, uh, don't think of it just as an organizational structure. Uh, think of it as people who at one time were dead in their trespasses and sins, that God breathed life into them, if you will, when they were saved, and they have decided to bind themselves voluntarily, voluntarily together with a body of doctrine and carry out the Great Commission as a group. That is a church. And that's very special, and it's very important. Listen, because they've been called out, and it, and it is for a purpose. Let me ask you something. What do you think the purpose for the Tri-State Baptist Church is? You know, when this church in Thessalonica, and you can flip back there, uh, go back to 2 Thessalonians. Because when we talk about um, the church at Thessalonica, what was, what was their goal? What was God's intent for the church at, the, at, at Thessalonica? Well, we saw that from them sounded out the word of God so that everybody in the area heard the gospel from that church. Would not that be the same purpose for the Tri-State Baptist Church? You see, when, when we are called the Tri-State Baptist Church, understand something. That is, I, I have never been prouder than to say that I pastor this church because we are bound together by doctrine. People can challenge me on what I believe. They can mock me for what I believe. They can do whatever they want to. I really don't care because I know I have the truth and I know, and I do my best to stick by it. I do my best to, to interpret it properly. And, and if someone says, I don't believe what you believe, then I can say to them, show me chapter and verse, and I'll be glad to, to discuss it with you. But listen, I'm not embarrassed by what we believe. I'm not shy about what we believe. I'm certainly not going to back down from what we believe because I believe it's the Word of God. And, and, and listen, I am more thankful that there are a group of people who believe that their souls are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, I am, I am, and they're willing to join together and push forward for the cause of Christ. You know, when we first came here, we didn't have that guarantee. We knew we were going to push forward. We knew our family was going to take those steps. But I had no idea who God had in mind to walk with us, you know, shoulder alongside. I had no idea. So when I look out and I see, of course, I don't see much tonight, <laughs> just Lazarus and Brother Kent and my wife. Uh, but when I look out on a typical Sunday morning, I don't see people. I see God's provision for Thompson, Connecticut and the surrounding community. I see folks who, who, who are bound together by doctrine, who, who love each other in, in the Lord, who are here to fulfill the Great Commission, who are here to labor together and serve one another and be there for comfort and be there for, for help if you need it. And, and that's very, very important because, listen, I don't ever want you to feel embarrassed about being a, a Baptist, a member of a Baptist church. You know, I don't ever want you to shrink away from that. I don't ever want you to say, oh, you know, don't go to the website because you're going to hear sermons and, and some of those might be confrontational. Don't shy away from those kinds of things because can I tell you something? When a, when a, when a ministry, when a, when a message gets confrontational, can I tell you that many times it's in those moments of confrontation that lives are changed. If it's confrontational, it means it's addressing what you're thinking. In other words, you have a course that you're on and the Word of God has a way of, of hitting us like a brick wall and, and changing the course that we're on. Listen, that's a good thing. It's a good thing when you have to sit down and evaluate your life and your direction and the way you're handling things. 
It's a good thing when God is working in your heart and you're saying, gee, am I right on this or do I have to reevaluate? You know what? Because that's where change comes from. I heard an old preacher one time say this. He said that if Jesus preached the way most pastors preach, he never would have been crucified. <laughs> I thought that was quite a statement. And the truth is, God has chosen to work in and through the local church, and God's plan for evangelizing and discipling and world missions and church planting all funnels through that local church. Uh, people today are freelancing it. They're doing their own thing, and, and, and I hear it all the time through men who want to come through and present their ministry, and, and they're not church planting. They're, they're, they're doing something else, and, and, and that's fine under the authority of a local church. Uh, but listen, you can't, you can't do that stuff on your own. That's not how God designed it. When, when someone says, I'm a member of that church, listen, be thankful for that. Be thankful that you are part of a local New Testament church that preaches God's word and fellowships with each other. That's very important because so many people today don't have that. You know, and it's because God put so much emphasis on the local church. At the time of this writing, uh, Thessalonica, and I'll probably say that wrong a hundred times tonight, so just edit as you need to. <laughs> but Thessalonica was a church of about 250,000 people at that time. That's a lot of folks. And the mission of that church, God put that church in that place so they could minister to those people. Uh, they could reach into that community. They can, uh, like in 1 Thessalonians where it says, from out of you sounded out the word of God. So they were doing their job. And, and I have to look at our church and I say, you know I, know, I know times are trying right now. I understand that. But what about us? Are we, are we getting the job done? We are, in other words, what do you think God's plan is for Thompson, Connecticut, and Webster, Massachusetts, and, and Pomfret, and Putnam, and, and the surrounding communities, and even the borders towns of Rhode Island? What is God's plan for them? Well, you know what? I, I, when God put it in my heart, in my wife's heart to come out here and start this church, we came with a purpose. And God gave us that purpose. And I believe that our purpose here is just like you would imagine, just to reach this area for Christ. It's to encourage people to come and preach the gospel to them and see them baptized and join the church. That's, that's Christianity 101. You know what I mean? That's not, that's not Bible college stuff. That's basic Christianity. Gee, that church, you know, when you're saved, you're baptized, you join that church, you become a member of it, you are then part of the, the tri-state Baptist church. There shouldn't be years worth of hesitation in, should I join a church? Yes, you should. Is it this one? Well, that's what you'll have to sort out. But you should. You should be a member of a local New Testament church, because that's Bible. That's the way God has it set up. When Paul says to the church of Thessalonica, he's talking to that, that, that group of people that have chosen to bind themselves together through sound doctrine and take on the mission for the church, which is to reach the world for Christ. What a privilege it is that, you know what, God has a plan for this area. You and I have the privilege of being a part of it. It might not be a huge part, but i got to tell you something. I've got a part in it. You've got a part in it. I don't know what that part is, and sometimes you don't know what that part is. But we do have a part. We have a role, and that should be exciting to you that God has a plan to reach this area with the gospel message and has put you in a position to take part in that. Listen, when Paul says to that church that they are the church, you know, what a great privilege that is. We take that for granted. People come in all the time and, and, and you know, I don't go to any church and I don't want to be part of the church, and it's like you are missing out on so much by not associating yourself or coming so infrequently that that uh, you, know, you don't even know anybody's name. Uh, that, that you're just missing out on the whole point of the thing here. But you see, God's plan is to reach this area. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I read this to you already. Uh, For this cause also we thank God without ceasing, because when you receive... Well, if you go back to it with me, please. We're not far. 1 Thessalonians 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at verse 13. The Bible says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You know, there's, there's kind of two parts to this. There's really the part that, 
is really the part that you anticipate with the preacher. But I got to tell you something. I could preach the best message in the world, anointed of God, and, and it could be the best message in the world, but it's not going to go very far if you don't allow it to change you. So as, as much as the focus is on the preaching and the Word of God, uh, you know, my prayer is that people will receive it as the Word of God. And if you notice, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, when he says, for this cause we thank, uh, also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the Word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth the Word of God. The greatest part of a church is to have teachable people, people who believe that what you're giving them is not opinion, but Scripture, and the principles are Scripture, and they receive it as Scripture. They don't receive it as, well, that's pastor's thought, that's pastor's idea. And I, I truly stay, try to stay away from opinions as much as I can, because I have opinions, you know, but I try not to base my sermons on them or instruct this church on them, uh, because that's not what you're here for. But I appreciate the fact that the church takes the preaching as it is. You know what's interesting? If you, if you look in the Bible, if you went to Ephesians or Colossians or First and Second Timothy, Paul opens up those books with, a, with, a, with sort of a Paul, an apostle of Christ type of introduction. He introduces himself and he says, it's me, Paul, the apostle of Christ. Almost like an authoritative statement, like don't forget, uh, you know, I'm an apostle, I have this office of apostle. Uh, and, and of course, in Corinthians, he defends his apostleship to a very carnal church. But in, the, in this church, he doesn't do that. He doesn't spend time defending who he is or the authority of his message because they had already made the decision that they were going to trust him with their heart. In other words, they already believed he was who he was and that what he was preaching was the message from God. So he didn't have to prove that every time. And I'm so thankful when I get in this pulpit, I don't have to, I don't have to prove anything to anybody. I can just state what the Bible says. And I appreciate the fact that that people receive that. You know what I mean? I hope you understand what I'm saying. I wish I could see your faces. Uh, but, but uh, you know, if, if God is going to bless our lives and our church, we need to have that attitude. We need to trust that what God says is what God means, and we follow that. I want you to see, because that's, that, that mindset, by the way, that mindset is against our culture today. Everybody thinks today, you know, people think you're lying to them. It doesn't really matter what you say. I've been reading some of, you know, there's, there's big controversies about some churches that are opening, and I, I read the comments about it because many of the communities are not in favor of those churches opening. And I was reading the comments, and the comments are, um, you know, the church is after your money, and that pastor just wants the glory. And in other words, people are very cynical already going into this, you know? People already think the church has an agenda that isn't a spiritual agenda. It's some kind of uh, some kind of kingdom you're trying to build, or that you know at the end of the church offering, uh, all of that money goes into the pastor's checking account or something along those lines. You know, it's ridiculous. And, and, but but people already have that cynicism, and it's nice to come and preach uh, to a bunch of people who really don't have that cynicism. They. They know you care about them. They know you're preaching the Word of God. You have a Bible in front of you. You can read it yourself. You can check out what is being said. Uh, I'm all for that. Uh, but, but listen, that's an attitude that God can get a hold of and use in a local church. Uh, notice not only their title, but notice secondly, please, uh, go back to our text, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number, uh, verse number 2. Not only their title, but secondly, their tools. Their tools. Look at verse number two. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul almost always uses this type of greeting. He says, grace and peace, grace and peace. Uh, and by the way, this is the proper attitude of a Christian to another believer, grace and peace. Many churches have ruined, many churches have been ruined through evil speaking and gossiping and talking about each other's problems in a, in a negative way, and really tearing people down rather than edifying and praying for each other. And you want to be careful of that. You, you know, the Bible tells us for by, in Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we remember, we remember that the Christian life starts off by the grace of God. We're saved by faith. We're saved 
by, uh, I'm sorry, by grace are you saved through faith. So it's God's grace that gives us the ability to be saved, the fact that he makes the gospel available to us. But you have to remember that once, once you're saved, once you're a believer, the Christian life also continues by grace. It also continues. When Paul says grace to you, he's, he's acknowledging that not only are they saved by grace, but they are living the Christian life by grace. Those things that you have uh, in your life that are positive would be there because of the grace of God. Now, those things that you have in your life that are negative, those are not of grace. Those are you. Those are the flesh. Those are the things that you revert back to. But when the grace of God, you know, all the things that we have in our lives, the changes that you've made, the things that you believe God's working on in your life, those are all things that are tied to the grace of God. If God convicts you during a message, listen, that is God's grace. When he tells you you're not, a, you know, you're not acting the right way as a husband or you're not doing the right thing as a wife or as a child, you're disobedient and that's not right. Those are, those are things that God provides for us by grace because he's trying to correct us and trying to get us on a road or off a road or, or redirect our path. Those are very important things. But it's only by the grace of God that you and I can remain faithful. 1 Peter 5.10 you know what? Turn there with me, please. You're probably getting sleepy at this point, so that's a good thing to do. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter 5. And look at verse 10. The Bible says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. I love that verse. I, I love that expression. I love that word settled. Years ago, I preached a message called the settled soul out of that text. And, and, and it means that when all is said and done, you'll be settled, you'll be stable. In other words, you're going to go through some trials. And what is, what is Paul offering to these people? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, what's Paul offering when he says rest with us? What is he offering to them? Is he offering them Changes in their situations? Absolutely not. What he's offering them is a reminder of, listen, you guys are a church. You're a called out assembly. You've been bound together by a body of doctrine. You're there to love one another and exhort one another and comfort one another. And all those things that we know are the one another commands in the Bible. You have that advantage over a world that for the most part doesn't have that advantage. But the second thing is that grace and peace are the tools that we have to use. Notice it's not it's not, um, it's not criticism. Notice that it's not gossip. It's not just talking about each other. That's not the tools God gives us. He, offers, he tells us, listen, grace and peace, grace and peace. So we're talking about these things. Somebody said that, that faith that cannot be shaken is a faith that has already been shaken. And I like that. But that's where that's where the peace comes from. It comes through recognizing the availability of God's enabling and strengthening grace. Uh, why would Paul use that as an encouragement to these troubled people? Well, because sometimes we need to be reminded that without the grace of God, there's nothing good in us at all. And, and I know that doesn't sit well with a lot of people, but that's what the truth is. It's God's grace. You know what? If you have, you have, you have positive thoughts towards people, you have, you have the the desire to do good works, that's God's grace in your life. Notice lastly, please, their title, their tools, lastly, their temperament. Notice what Paul says in verse number three. Because these are, these are things that he was giving them thanks for. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet. Look what he says. Because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you uh, uh, all toward each other abounded. So they're growing in some things here. You know, um, their faith was growing. In other words, Paul was thrilled to see that uh, as he was bound, uh, he had to give thanks for them because their faith was growing. There's nothing more exciting than to see somebody grow in their faith. And by the way, you see that too, not just me. But I, so many times when I look out over the congregation you know, I see the faces, I see that person who's, you know, coming to a new service for the first time or, uh, or has just made some decision in their life they're going to be baptized or they've decided to join the church or 
or they've started giving, or they've, you know, they want to be involved with something. You know what that is? That's a growing in someone's faith. When you look around, when you look around, think about where we are right now as a church. Think about people who have contacted you to make sure you're okay. Think about people who have done something for you uh, that you had a need for. Uh, you know what that is? that is? That is people growing in their faith. That is people reaching out because sometimes it's uncomfortable. That is people reaching out to encourage someone else because, listen, because God put you on someone's heart. Can you imagine? The God of heaven took time to put your life on somebody's heart that they might check on you and make sure you're okay. That's amazing. You know, that's amazing to me. But he, he thanks them. He thanks them for the, the fact that their faith was growing. You know, we've been reminiscing, of course, we just had our anniversary, and it wasn't, uh, it was 2009, I think, 2009, when we first knocked on the door of our neighbor here and uh, talked to him about this property that now the church is on. And I remember sitting there, uh, sitting there talking to him, and, and uh, the Lord... Long story, but I'll keep it short. But we stopped there. I talked to him, and he had, uh, I wanted to buy 10 acres up front here for about 150000 or 160 grand. He wanted to sell me the whole 45 acres for almost half a million bucks, $450,000. And, of course, we didn't, have, we didn't have that kind of money. And I told him that, you know, that's not going to work for us. We're just looking for these top, these front 10. And we went back and forth. Brother Morrison came with me, and we sat down and negotiated. And, and I... It was a very odd situation. We ended up buying the 45 acres for $220,000, uh, which, was, which was very good. And, and I was able to, you know, and, and I remember at the, at, at the end of those negotiations, and they were very difficult. You can ask Brother Morrison. Um, I remember him looking at me and saying, I know you said we have a deal, but I'm worried about your finances. He was worried about us getting a loan. And I, had, you know, I was thrilled to be able to look him in the eye and let him know that we didn't need to get a loan at that point, that we could pay cash for it. And, and he was, he, he, it was a testimony to this church. It wasn't, an, you know, it wasn't like we were bragging, but he was like, you're kidding. And it was wonderful to be able to say, this church has grown to the point where people are giving and, and they see the vision and we're pressing forward and... Folks have gotten on board with all this when we had our, when we had our, uh, our offering for, uh, for building the building. And we had uh, $35,000 in the plate on one day, one offering. And, and that was an amazing thing for this church. Those were markers of growing in faith. And I don't think we're done here. I think we've got much more to accomplish. But you know what? It's encouraging when you see the temperament of the people. When you know, we've had missionaries who have had problems. We've had some of our folks that ha ran into issues. We take a love offering for them, and we're able to help them out financially. You know what? Those are, those are great moments in a church's life, and I'm afraid sometimes we skip over them. And, and I understand that, you know, you don't want to live in the past or yesterday's faith, but it, it's good to be reminded of those things because it's, it's growth. It, you know, and you may not see it that way, but it is. But he, he thanks them. First of all, uh, he notices their temperament, their faith was growing. Secondly, in verse number three, their charity was abounding. Uh, verse number three, he says, uh, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other uh, abounded. Uh, you know, when Paul is giving thanks that he saw their charity or their love for each other was abounding. I think uh, something that has really been brought out during this whole time of separation has been the love of the people for each other and touching base and cards in the mail and phone calls and emails and notes of encouragement. And all. Listen, that's wonderful. And I'm proud of you for doing that because that is, that is something that I cannot do all of that. You know what I mean? The, the church is at a point where we need to individually reach out to each other and encourage each other. Hey, I've been praying for you. How's everything going? You know, uh, notice your prayer list. Look who's on the prayer list. We've got a, a list this week of, uh, I think, five or six people, and we're doing it by seating order, so don't try and get it. You know, it's not alphabetical. It's by seating order as I see people in their chairs. So don't ever move your chair when you get back, or I won't pray for you. <laughs> but, uh, but listen, that's, uh, it's just nice to contact people like that, and I hope you're sharing your prayer requests. But he sees that he sees not only their, that their charity was abounding, 
But lastly, that their perseverance. In the midst of their tribulation, they stuck to it. One of my biggest fears when this all happened was what is this church going to look like when we get back together again? Who's not going to be there? And it breaks your heart to think about. But you know what? We've touched base with, I think, just about everybody who is here. And I, 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 don't, I don't see that happening. I, I don't see people falling away. I don't see people failing in their faith. I see people who are staying at it. You're persevering. You're staying strong. You know that there will come a day, of course, where we will all meet again together here uh, or in the air, right, Lord willing? Uh, and, and we will be able to uh, shake each other's hands and give each other hugs and all those kinds of things. And we'll get right back to where we used to be in that sense. But it, that day isn't yet. But we need to persevere a little bit longer. You know, there's, there's nothing better as a pastor than knowing, knowing that people aren't doing the things that they're doing just because the pastor said, but because it's their conviction, because it's their, now they've read the scriptures, they've applied it to their lives, and it's now your conviction. And that conviction is what holds you as an anchor in these troubled waters of life. Listen, that's tremendously encouraging. And I appreciate it. And you know what? They persevered. You know, anybody can be a flash in the pan. I appreciate, though, seeing the faithfulness of God's people. You know, Paul, we're talking about resting with Paul. Paul says, I, I want you to rest with me. Come rest with me. And, and we say, Paul, what are you offering? Well, I'm reminding you of who you are. You're a church. You're a local body of believers bound together by doctrine. And you're here to carry out the Great Commission. But you also have some tools in your toolbox. It's grace and peace. Let's treat each other with grace and peace. And number three was their temperament. They were persevering, staying at it. Stay at it. You're doing a great job. We're into this now for somewhere around six weeks or so. A couple more to go, and then it'll be a bad memory. <laughs> but you know what? You can make it with the Lord's help. Stay in your Bible. Stay in your devotional life. Uh, uh, stay in the habit of, of being ready for church services. Don't don't take it lightly, don't, and I don't want to offend you. Don't sit around in your pajamas and approach church that way. Get serious about it. Get your Bible, follow along, help guide your kids in the right way, because those are, those are habits that you're picking up, and they may be harder to forsake than you think. But listen, I, I love you in the Lord. We care about you. We miss seeing you. But I want you to rest with Paul. Paul says, rest, rest with me. Come rest with us. I want you to have that rest. Remember who you are. You're the Tri-State Baptist Church. Remember, you have tools, grace and peace. And I appreciate your temperament. You're staying at it. Can I tell you, keep praying for our folks. Pray for those who are uh, struggling right now, uh, certainly the, the Jarvis family. And pray for Lily, please. And uh, pray for Forrest and, and his mom that uh, she doesn't have the virus there. And you know what? There's nothing like knowing that people are praying for you. So let's pray together, and we'll end here. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, that you love us so much and you've given us so much. Lord, help us never to take our congregation for granted, this wonderful church that you're building. And I pray, Lord, as, as others can see uh, the love of God in our people, may it attract them. Lord, I, I pray that this church would be known for its love for each other and certainly its love for the Word of God. And I thank you, Lord, that you've just preserved these truths for us and you give it to us. Uh, daily as we, as we approach the Word of God. Thank you for all those who are helping and being involved and reaching out, showing God's love to other people. Uh, it's wonderful to see. And Lord, I pray that we might uh, take this cue from Paul and rest with him. And Lord, we know it's not a changing of our circumstances, but a changing of our perspective. We love you tonight. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in tonight.